Welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast. Brendan Glasheen joined by Sean Zarillo on Friday the 13th. Friday, September 13th, a full slate, Major League Baseball, 15 games. Just a couple looks from Zarillo before we go. It's that time of year, folks. We are coming down the wire in this Major League Baseball season. Uh, we'll get a best bet, an underdog play, and then a couple of total looks from Sean. Maybe anything else that he has on his mind as we head into the weekend. I know he said, what did you say last week, Zarillo? Maybe in last Friday or it was, it was early last week that you're real – the, the, the dates you have circled are, are in two weeks from now when we get those kind of playoff previews. Or yes, maybe September 24th to 26th. Um, yeah. Mets at Braves for a three game set and Baltimore at the New York Yankees for a three game set. So potential third wild card in the NL and then the American League East champion will be decided on those dates. The Yankees have gained a lead. The Mets have gained a lead, but we'll see if they trade them back or at least pull closer uh, in the next 11 days or so. Okay, very good. All right, let's begin. You got a best bet on one of the first games of the night. The possibly the one of the hotter teams in the league, the Tigers. They are hosting the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, Detroit Tigers. The Tigers are thirty-seven and twenty-six since the start of July. They have a plus forty-six run differential. The Orioles are thirty and thirty-three since July first. They have a minus twenty-seven run differential. So everything the Orioles did to get into playoff positioning occurred over the first three months of the season. They have fallen off of a cliff. You look at the names in the back end of their lineup, you know, compared to all the prospects they had coming into the season, this Orioles team has not performed up to expectations. Now, I took their under 91 and a half. Every single projection system recommended their under 91 and a half in the preseason. I didn't want to bet it, and it looked dead for the first three months, but they've fallen flat on their faces. And despite all the depth, they've really struggled. Uh, you know, they went out and acquired Zach Eflin. He went on the IL. Grayson Rodriguez spent time in the IL. Corbin Burns has not been as good this season as he was in prior years. So the ceiling for this Oriole team has been lowered. Adley Rutschman has not hit. Um, the ceiling for this team has certainly been lowered. Do not love their bullpen for the postseason. And the Tigers have just been playing extremely well. And it coincides with when they got most of their lineup back. Um, they were missing Riley Green for a month and a half. They were missing uh, Kerry Carpenter for two months of the season, three months of the season. Cole Keith started hitting in mid-August. And since mid-August, last 30 days, the Tigers are 12th in WRC+, 102 WRC+. The Orioles are 17th, 95 WRC+. So the Tigers right now are hitting better. I would still project the Orioles as a better offense, but, I mean, the Tigers justifiably are hitting better, and also it coincides with when they got most of their lineup back. Uh, they also brought Spencer Torkelson back up, you know, at the start of September. Jace Young came up around mid-August as well. So a lot of reasons why this Tigers lineup should be hitting better and have been hitting better of late. I have win totals for both of these teams that I'm sweating yeah. out. So as I mentioned, the Orioles under 91 and a half, I need them to go nine and six, or they need to go nine and six or better in order to clear that. I need them to go eight and seven or worse the rest of the way in order to cash that. I also have the Tigers under 81 and a half. I need them to go six and nine or worse in order to cash that. Uh, so we'll see how this series plays out, how it impacts those totals. But yeah, I, I just think it's very evident that the Tigers are playing better. The Orioles have not been playing well for quite a while. I also like Brand Herter quite a lot. And Herter should get the bulk innings for the Orioles today. 2.5 expected ERA, 3.25 expected FIP, 19% strikeout minus walk rate, 3.7 body ERA. Really like the results Herter's put up this year. The pitch modeling metrics aren't elite. They're around league average. But he's come in, worked mostly as a bulk reliever, gone like five or six innings every single time he takes the ball. He's only actually started one game. I don't think they're going to start him today. Otherwise, they probably would have announced him. They're likely going to put an opener in front of him uh, and just sort of play the game backwards. But yeah, as long as Detroit holds teams down, doesn't let them score four runs, they seem to win every game or they seem to win like 80% of games. They seem to get the three runs every time. If you get to four runs, you can beat them. But otherwise they're very difficult because their bullpen is solid and Herder should give them good innings in the middle of the game today. So uh, Detroit projected plus 103 would bet them down to about plus 112 or better. Okay, very good. Yeah, the offense has been down for for Baltimore their last week or so, and they are just uh, two and five in their last seven uh, coming into this particular series tonight. Okay, we're skipping fade the public. Uh, not enough data right now in the action uh, action app here on this Friday morning. So we'll shift gears to uh, your favorite underdog on the slate which which team has some value tonight that might be uh might might be being overlooked 
The Colorado Rockies projected them at plus 112, would bet this down at plus 120. Don't want to invest too heavily in the Rockies down the stretch here. It's not like they're playing for anything. <laughs> Even a team like the Rangers, you know, who brought up Kumar Rocker yesterday, bringing up Jacob DeGrom today, it kind of feels like they have something to play for. They're playing for something in 2025. They're still the defending World Series champions. I'm still like, there's an element of like respect that goes into that. What are the Rockies playing for? But at the same time, um, this is something I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago. I was finally able to dig into it. So I had teased the fact that I feel like anecdotally, the first game that teams go to Coors Field, there's an adjustment offensively where they're trying to lift the ball and just hit home runs or what, whatever it is, you know, the pitching adjustments that you have to make. So the Rockies all time since 2005, they're the most profitable team in the Action Labs database. They have a 2.5% ROI since 2005 at home, just period at home. The Rays are second, 1.6% ROI. The Yankees are third, and the Brewers are fourth, both around 1%. First game of the series, though, at Coors Field. As I said, overall, 53.2%. First game of the series at Coors Field, Rockies, 54.8% win rate. 31.71 return for a consistent $100 better, 6.4% ROI. So a 6.4% ROI in the first game of the series, a 2.5% ROI overall at Coors Field. Last two years alone, first game of a series at Coors, Rockies 27 and 20, plus 17.46 for a consistent $100 better, 37% ROI. I think there's something there. I think there's an adjustment that teams have to make when they go to Coors Field and they play the Rockies. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's they're lifting the ball too much, trying to hit home runs and they're hitting the flyouts or, you know, not trying to just poke the ball and get base hits because this is something I also regularly discuss. Coors Field, even though it has this reputation as this offensive haven, it's like fourth or fifth in home run park factor. It's first by a lot in base hits because the outfield is humongous. There's way more room to smack, you know, base hits in front of the outfielders, but also to hit the gaps and get doubles and triples as a result. It's a really good triples park. So even though you would expect home runs to increase at Coors Field, they do, but it's not as much as the base hits increase. And I think just taking more of a contact-oriented approach is actually the right approach, of course. Now, the Rockies have taken measures to combat that. They built themselves or tried to build themselves a good defense. They have a really good outfield. Every outfield position above average. Brenton Doyle, one of the best outfield defenders in baseball. Though, granted, that is largely because of his arm. Uh, not, yeah, I mean, he's good range, but his arm is incredible. Um, but they also have an elite left side of their infield, too, with Ryan McMahon and Ezekiel Tovar. And their first baseman has been above average this season as well, Michael Tolia. So... Uh, second base, right where Brendan Rodgers plays, that's really the only below average defensive position on the diamond for Colorado. They're 11th in defensive run saves. They're 15th in outs above average. They're not the worst team in the world defensively. <laughs> that is the one thing they do well is play defense. And as I said, they're also apparently all time undervalued at home, but specifically in the first game of their series at home at Coors Field, I think they're undervalued. So made them 112, plus 112 for Friday's matchup and would bet them at plus 120. Or better, and uh, we'll see if we bet them in other games in the series, but definitely betting them for game one. Okay, two more before we go. A couple of totals. Uh, curious where your mind is on, on these games and why these totals jump out. An over and an under. Yeah, Guardians Royals over seven and a half. I tried to bet the over seven and a half yesterday. We felt a run short. Um, just needed one, one base hit with the runner in scoring position to have cashed that. Feels like coming up short one run hit or one hit one run short on a lot of these overs lately, but Continuing to bet the overs at Progressive Field, uh, another thing we've discussed, the shipping container removal there this year, the fact that that park is playing a bit differently. Now, the wind is blowing in from right field today, 7 to 9 miles an hour. But it's still going to be 77 degrees at first pitch. We're not into the 60s in Cleveland. You know, Northeast, we've talked about getting into the 60s. Even last night, it was pretty cool. Uh, it's still, still relatively warm in the Midwest. And... I think the both pens for both teams are also a bit overvalued as well. Um, the Rays are 12th in expected FIP, 8th in strikeout minus walk rate on the year. Guardians, 15th and 14th respectively. And Cleveland has really fallen off in the second half. Uh, they were first in expected FIP, second in strikeout minus walk rate in the first half. But their bullpen, 15th and 11th in the second half. So I think their relievers are getting a bit fatigued. The Rays lead MLB with a 262 ERA in their bullpen in the second half. They rank closer to fifth in pitch modeling metrics. So 
I think both bullpens, a touch over value. These are both teams I would expect in my mind to be top five bullpens. The Rays have kind of performed that way in the second half. The Guardians performed that way in the first half, but Cleveland is not performing that way right now. Um, but just to reiterate, the park factor stuff for progressive field this season, 38, 27, and four to the over. 963 for a consistent $100 better ROI of around 14%, but it's been the left-handed power. 93 park factor for left-handed home runs from 2021 to 2023, 7% below league average. This year, 123, 23% above league average. So guys pulling the ball in the air to right field, the ball is just carrying more, more home runs, more extra base hits. Uh, made this total 8.3. So the over 7.5 up to minus 115, even though the wind is blowing in from right field, but still made this total about 2% above a league average run scoring environment for today. Uh, and then the Dodgers and Braves under eight and a half wind blowing in from left field, the 10, 10 to 11 miles an hour. So that did knock my total down. It truest in Atlanta. I really like Spencer Schwellenbach, 3.4 expected ERA, 325 expected fit, 311 body ERA, uh, 109 pitching plus rating. I think he gives the Braves a nice one, two punch if they can make the postseason with him and, Chris Sale. I think Schwellenbach's been awesome. If they get Strider back next year, they form a really nice top three in their rotation. Obviously, Max Fried, you know, a guy you can include in there as well, even though he's taken a step back this year. And then Landon Knack has shown some pretty good stuff for the Dodgers, too. The Dodgers trying to figure out their postseason rotation. I think Knack may get postseason innings for them. 3.5 expected ERA. The pitching models do not like him quite as much. 99 pitching plus 475 body ERA, but I, I like his stuff. Um, I think he's I think he's a solid arm. And it seems like the Dodgers are just looking for guys they can get innings from at this point. Both mm-hmm. bullpens were off, though, on Thursday. Both teams were off. Uh, so all the high leverage relievers for both teams should be available for tonight's matchup. So made this 8.25. Would like the under 8.5 at even money. Could wait to see if this gets up to 9 because it does seem like it's heading that direction. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, if you have the choice, if you have the option between 8.5 at plus money, that is roughly equivalent to nine and a half minus 119. So I would take the eight and a half even money over nine and a half minus 120. Generally speaking, at the key number, it's a 19 cent adjustment. At the non key numbers, it's a 18 or 17 cent adjustment. So love throwing that out there. Nine minus 120, not quite as good for me as eight and a half at even money. If you have the choice between them, take the plus money. Okay. We'll get into this maybe early next week, too. I know we did this last week. What's your latest temperature on Merrill versus Skeens for NL Rookie of the Year? Because that price on Merrill has come down to minus 320, and Skeens is plus 250. Yeah, discuss Skeens till Monday. Discuss this with Charlie DeCirco on on, uh, Green Dot Daily on Tuesday. Um, Every start that Skeens gets continues to push things closer and closer. Now, in order for him to win the award, voters would need to completely change how they voted for Spencer Strider and Michael Harris two years ago because Strider finished with more wins above replacement than Harris. And he's going to finish, or or I should say Skeens is going to finish with a bigger volume gap than Harris and Strider had relative to one another. Harris didn't even clear 500 plate appearances. Strider was around where Skeens is now in terms of innings. So Merrill has a bigger advantage, both in terms of wins above replacement, in terms of playing time, than Strider had over Harris, and yet Harris still, I believe, had 18 of the 30 first place votes or 22 of the 30 first place votes. It, it was relatively dominant in terms of voting. So that's that's like the main thing for me is has the schemes hype overtaken the voters' attitude from how they voted for the same award mm-hmm. two years ago? Because I think the, sh- the case for Merrill over Strider is much stronger than the case for Harris or I'm sorry, the, the case for Merrill over Skeens is much stronger than the case was for Harris over Strider at the time. So uh, it would it would have to be a completely complete change in voting. Uh, but that said, you know, if Skeens gets the ERA under two, if he throws three more starts, if he pitches to the end of the season, I think it's a toss-up. You know, every start he makes gets it a little bit closer. So I'd take a dollar off the line every time he starts the rest of the way, right? So okay. he's plus 300 now. If he starts again, it's probably plus 200, plus 150. If he starts again after that, you're probably talking about even money. So yeah, I I think, uh, you know, it comes down to how many homers Merrill hits the rest of the way, how he performs, but also just the playing time for Skeens and then voters' attitudes. So 
Yeah, if I'm handicapping it off of the voters from two years ago, Merrill should be a unanimous pick, but that's not going to be the case. It seems like people are going to vote for Skeens regardless, considering he's been the most efficient pitcher. But for me, you know, personally, 150 games played in the field does not stack up with 20 starts on the mound. The war totals prove that out. Uh, and I think as good as Skeens has been, and even though Skeens has probably been the best pitcher in baseball, I think Merrill has still been more valuable and he's been the Padres' best player. You know, don't overlook that. Where are the Padres without Jackson Merrill? If you trade Jackson Merrill for Paul Skeens, are the Padres still as good as they've been? I'm not sure because they, mm -hmm. they needed the offensive production that Merrill gave them this year. And with Tatis getting hurt, you know, with Machado not being 100%, not being able to play the field earlier in the year, Merrill gave them a huge lift. Uh, and you, you can't overlook that. So I, I think it's actually, I think the ultimate result is MLB might end up creating a division between a, a hitter rookie of the year and a pitcher rookie of the award because this is going to be such a good race and it has been such a good race all year. And there's been four or five different rookie pitchers who have vied for the award as well between Jared Jones and Shota uh, and Yoshi Nobu Yamamoto starting off the year as the favorite. So like it, to me, it's almost like, is MLB going to create a separate rookie of the year pitcher and hitter awards uh, because they don't want this conversation happening in the future. Like this, you know, one of these guys getting denied because they've been so good. Two years ago, 2022 NL Rookie of the Year voting, Michael Harris had 22 first place votes. 22 to the 30, yeah. And Strider had 21 second place votes. So they yeah, basically. Strider 4.9 versus 4.8 war. Uh, and as I said, like Harris was 480 plate appearances or so. Strider was about 120 innings, which is where Skeens is now. And Merrill is at like 550 plate appearances and has a full win lead in war. So it would have to be a big change. And Luis Heal is your favorite for American League. This, these are the only two they think are really close, right? Luis Heal, the the American League Rookie of the Year and the NL Rookie of the Year. American League, Luis Heal's at uh, plus 125. Is, is he really? Wow, that's really shortened up because Kowser, Kowser was the favorite. Uh, Austin Wells overtook him. Yeah, Heal, I mean, Heal's had a couple of good starts since. Um, I'm curious where the war, the war total is for Heal now. That would indicate to me that he's overtaken in war again. So he's at 2.5. I think Wells is in the threes, though. So that's actually surprising um, because we always defer to, to hitters, all things being equal, regardless of the war leader, uh, as you know, as I just talked about with Harris and Strider. Yeah, uh, Austin Wells is at 3.6 war. Kowser's in the threes. Luis Seals at 2.5. So I disagree with that. I think it should be Austin Wells. Uh, I made the argument for Kowser over Wells on Wednesday. But Wells has fully overtaken him in the market. Uh, Kowser just has more counting stats. He's been there for a longer part of the season. And I think voters would defer to his counting stats over Wells' defensive value, which is what's driven him in terms of war. But he still has time to produce in the middle of the Yankees' order the rest of the way. Kowser's slidden down the Orioles' order and is not hitting. Uh, you know, Wells has been hitting. So I, I think Wells can catch up or surpass him in terms of voting. I don't know if he's done that yet. I'm surprised to see Heal as the favorite. Um, hmm. I guess coming back from the IL, pitching well, but no, I, I kind of disagree with that. Okay. All right, very good. Anything else? Are you good to go? No, good to go. Uh, we will uh, we'll be back here next Monday to uh, maybe look at some of these wildcard races. The Tigers are closing in on that third wildcard in the AL, so uh, making things a little bit interesting if, if Detroit keeps playing well, especially against Baltimore this weekend. You know, it should it should open up the AL East for the Yankees, but also at least make the wildcard a little bit interesting. So that series will be determinative of uh, which, which uh, race we're probably looking at a little bit closer on Monday. Yeah, the Tigers, I think the Tigers and Twins meet one more time, I mm. think. Uh, no, they don't. They don't play each other again. Um, but to your point, Tigers get Orioles, Royals, Orioles again. Those are their next nine games. So, yeah, so this, the six games against Baltimore are really going to be important for the wild card in the AL East. Okay, there you go. And that's right. You have a position on the Yankees to win the American League East yeah. over the mm -hmm. Orioles. Okay, that's it. Uh, as Sean said, we're back Monday. We're back to morning records for payoff pitch. Monday, Tuesday, Friday. So if you've been with us from the very beginning, we are back to our uh, normal morning record times. And that will be the same deal when we enter the postseason. More to come on that once we get a better idea of the schedule. But yeah, the baseball season does end uh, just as September ends. And then that first week of October is when the wild card rounds uh, start up. So again, stick with us. If you're 
Big into the into the fall classic, into baseball. We'll have more details as this regular season winds down. Find Sean Zarillo at Zarillo in the Action Network app and our other MLB contributors in the Action app as well. I'm Brendan Glasheen. Thanks for tuning in to Payoff Pitch. We are Action Network's MLB betting podcast. Talk to you again next week. Have a great weekend.